Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Tristiana Bickford. I'm the department's communications director based out of Santa Fe. Um, and we're really excited to have everyone joining us. Um, I was talking the other day and I was like, I'm really hopeful that about 30 to 40 people attend and we now have 105 um, of you joining us tonight. So I'm, I'm really excited and I'm glad that we could be here to help answer some questions and, um, and, uh, and, and help people get started um, before the drop even opens. Um, a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. We're going to have just a conversation um, and some of the questions that we get most office either most often either through social media or through um, uh, calls into our information center or into our staff. And so um, we're going to kind of address some of those and see if we can't help answer some of the, the starting questions that you have. And then I hope everybody has seen we have 15 um, Zoom meetings planned over the next month and a half. So we're going to cover everything from how to read the draw odds reports, which can be very confusing. So we're going to help clarify that a little bit. Um, we are um, going to talk about um, how to apply for the draw and we actually walk through that process. Um, we have all of our big game biologists are going to join us to talk about their species and answer questions about deer, elk, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, um, ibex, orcs, barbary. Um, and we probably will even get Havelina in there on somewhere. And I, Evan, thank you so much for mentioning that. I'm not sure how it's on, on Facebook, but I am glad that it is there. So thank you guys all for joining us on Facebook as well. Um, for tonight, um, I will be recording this and we will be putting it on our YouTube channel. So if for some reason you get disconnected and, and want to come back, um, that this whole session and all of our sessions will be posted on, on YouTube here shortly after we finish, um, probably within the next day or two. Um, for those of you that are here in Zoom, go ahead and if you have questions throughout this evening, um, throw them into the Q&A box or into the chat. I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat and get those, those questions answered. Um, and for those of you on Facebook, I'm going to try and figure out why it's not coming up on my, my iPad here in a minute and try and address those questions as well. But um, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, and we do have a Spanish translator that is in our attendee room. So if you guys need to, uh, to ask a question in Spanish, we will bring Darren in and, and he can do some, some translation for us. Um, if that happens, bear with us. It's our first time trying it out. So um, just bear with us. If we, if we have to go that route, we would be happy to, but, but we will have some issues along the way, I'm sure. Um, and so with that, our, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself because um, you're, you're what people actually came to see tonight. So. Yeah, well, gosh, thanks, Tristana. I, I really do appreciate that. Uh, my name is Art Anaya, and I am the Information Center Supervisor in our agency out of the Santa Fe office. I recently started within this position. Uh, it was November, mid-November. Uh, so I've been learning along the way. I have some excellent folks in our Information Center that have been really gracious and patient with me and helping me learn along the way. But I, I actually, I'd been with the agency four years prior under the habitat and land section, doing various habitat work projects and land, land management projects. So I'm very excited to be here and I'm hopeful that I can answer many of your questions. And if not, we always have our ISPA email that you can forward those to, and we'll, we'll likely get you an answer very soon. So thank you for having me. But yeah, absolutely. And I know it's been a short amount of time, but I know that you've helped um, answer phones throughout draw processes for several years now. This isn't isn't quite your first time. Yes, yeah. So it's not it's not quite my first time. It's my first time in this new role, but I, I've certainly helped out with our agency for two draw periods, uh, application periods, and I've picked up along the way the many questions that folks have had and had uh, some pretty good answers for them and. Yeah, so we're, we're here to help. That's good. I'm going to start, before we go back to our agenda, I'm going to start with one of the questions that I've been getting a lot on our social media accounts, um, and we've already gotten it here tonight, so let's address it straight up front, but are, do you know if the hard copies of the regulations are out yet? Yeah, so that's a great question, and unfortunately, due to a nationwide paper shortage, we weren't able to supply as many copies of the rules and information booklet as we hoped. What we do have, however, is it's been posted online on our web website, as well as there's going to be a limited supply sent to our area offices, which includes our Santa Fe office for public distribution. Great. And I was in the Santa Fe office today, and I know they haven't come in quite yet. So hopefully soon. Yes. Um, and I did today, I did hear that our um, Spanish regulations will also be out um, in print 
probably closer to the end of the month, but we did get a special round of those. So yeah. that, yes. was, that was great news. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Good. So um, you and I were talking yesterday and in the information center, I, I always think of our information center and the people at the front counter is like the front line of the agency. And you guys hear everything and see everything. And um, the stories I've heard and in your short amount of time, it sounds like you've already had some very interesting conversations with, with customers. Yes, very much so. You know, we're, we have such an incredibly talented staff in the information center that have a wealth of knowledge uh, across the board, our, our department board. And uh, we have questions that range anywhere from, uh, of course, license sales, draw applications, um, E plus agreements, any department program that our agency offers, our staff in the information center can handle those calls. Uh, it, it really, it surprises me. And it and it shouldn't because I know those people in there and it's just, it's so much information, but we're, we're always happy to help and we do it with such an amazing amount of customer service. Absolutely. Um, and I know it can get pretty stressful, especially when draw results come out and it doesn't go in your favor. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. We do get those calls too, but we're, yeah. we're always here to help. Absolutely. So what's the most unique phone call you've gotten so far? Far. Oh gosh, actually just, you know, as, as coincidence would have it, I was talking with an individual this, was it this morning or this afternoon? Uh, I can't recall, but anyways, this individual, he calls and he's wanting to inform us about a search and rescue service that he offers, which, you know, I, I wasn't familiar with. And I know uh, likely our Department of Public Safety here in New Mexico, they, they offer similar services, but, uh, you know, he went through this whole um you know, conversation about what services he offers if folks in our office, such as the biologists that are out in the field and conservation officers, if something were to go ha happen, he has different services that he can help provide support to uh, additional law enforcement. So it was really unique, but it was a good, it was a, <laughs> it was a good conversation. It really enlightened me a little more. So. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm always amazed at just the, the randomness and variety. And I know now our call volume is starting to go up significantly. I was in there yesterday and it seemed like, you know, um, Larry and Kevin and um, Robin are constantly on the phone. That's just ringing off the hook nonstop. Right. And I know it is at our regional offices as well. But um, so I, I know some of the, the just basic questions that people are calling in with already are, you know, how how do they create an account um, and how do they access their account? So what are some of the biggest challenges that people are having um, with it, with accounts that they've already had or with a new account? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like to start off, to go ahead and create an account, if you haven't ever hunted it or fished in the state of New Mexico, you'll need to create a customer account. Where that's located on our webpage is if you log into, or rather type in wildlife.state.nm.us, on the top banner there, there's a customer login button. You'll go ahead and select that. From there, it will prompt you if you have login credentials to go ahead and log in. If not, there's an option there to create an account. So first time users, you'll need to create an account. Very simple. You'll just have to put in some personal information, address, uh, of course, your name. Once that account's created, then you're able to to go ahead and start purchasing licenses with our department. But those that have accounts and let's say misplaced their login credentials, feel free to give us a call. We're always here to help. We'll provide you with some reset login credentials. That way you can access your account. And uh, from there, you can go ahead and purchase it, purchase licenses, uh, sign up for Hunter Education and st stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I, I hear pretty frequently um, from, from hunters and anglers too that are just kind of getting back into it and you know they go to set up an account and the system tells them they already have an account um that maybe one that's been deactivated but um what's the best thing for somebody to do in that situation that they can't access their help code or, or any of that kind of stuff right yeah we we do we do get multiple uh phone calls of folks that have tried to reset their password and of, of course you know technology as it is sometimes is faulty but in that event please feel free to reach out to one of us, our representatives in the information center, and we'll be able, again, to provide you with those login credentials. Um, there is circumstances, I like how you mentioned it, Tristana, that let's say you, you bought a fishing license years ago and you haven't, you know, you're, you're now thinking of coming and hunting in New Mexico. 
of course, you go in, you don't remember your, your password. You, don't, you might not even remember having an account with us. In that event, we certainly can go ahead, get some information from you, such as your date of birth, your name, try to look you up in your, our system. And sure enough, more likely than not, if you had purchased a license with us, we'll find you and we'll be able to provide you with those login credentials. Yeah, I know that we've found some people that um, had accounts set up like 20 years ago and they just got deactivated. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a while, but I, more often than not, it seems like we're able to find those and, and get them reset. Yeah, and, and it does. After a period of inactivity, it, it does deactivate, but uh, yeah, we're here to help you and we'll reactivate it as soon as you call. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, another question that I've been seeing quite a bit are um, what licenses and stamps do I need to purchase now? And what can I wait and purchase later? That's a great With your, when you draw, you're required to purchase your game hunting license, what we call a habit management validation stamp or fee. Those must be purchased at time of submitting your application. Now, an additional stamp that folks have an option to either purchase right when they submit the application or wait until they've maybe uh, received a su successful draw is our habitat stamp, which that allows you to hunt on public lands, which is uh, Forest Service or BLM. So that's something, let's say if you didn't wanna purchase it right away, it's $10, but you can go ahead and purchase that after the fact once you've successfully drawn out. Okay. And um, either you broke up or I did. Um, it seems to be a connectivity issue. Um, but can you mention that again? Which ones do you have to have up front? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. So the, the ones up front when you're applying for a draw is, of course, your game hunting license plus what we call a habitat management and access validation stamp. Those must be paid up front in order to apply for the draw. There is another stamp that folks can elect to purchase. It's the habitat stamp up front, or if in the event they are successfully drawn out, they can purchase that after. But what that habitat stamp is, it, it is a, a stamp that allows you to hunt public lands, forest service, or BLM. Thank you. Um, so if I purchase my license, if I apply for the draw in late January um, and go ahead and purchase that license, when does it become valid? So that's a great question. Our license year runs from April 1st through March 31st. So it's not a calendar year license year. It's uh, that April 1st through March 31st. So if okay. you're purchasing a fishing license um, or a, a fishing, game hunting and fishing license combo, let's say, when you're applying for the draw, that won't become valid until April 1st. April 1st. Of this and, year. and then if I wanted it to go fishing before then, I would just need to purchase a 2021 to 2022 hunting or fishing license. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go in, purchase that license, and you can purchase it over the counter, online, print it out. But that is valid through March 31st. Okay. That a good clarification. It always confuses me to buy it and not have have it valid. <laughs> so I, I always have to. Yeah, know. absolutely. And and I know some some folks aren't familiar with our licensing year, but it, it does run April first through March thirty first, and it's not calendar year. It's not a okay. calendar. Year. And on those licenses, are any of them refundable? The licenses or stamps? So they're not. Those ones are non refundable. If you submit an application, let's say for an elk or deer, those, if you are unsuccessful, they refund you on this. If you're a resident, $7 non refundable application fee or non resident would be a $13 non refundable resident fee, non resident fee, application okay. fee. I'm sorry. So, so the license and stamps are not refundable, but um, if you don't get drawn, you will get that, that tag money back. Or yes, for the application. Application. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and, and yep, we, um, you know, gotta love New Mexico reception. So we're doing our best to keep the, the connectivity, but um, if you need us to repeat something, let us know and we will. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting with the refund because I, I apply, uh, my family in Arizona and I apply with them and, you know, it's, it's the same thing that I don't always get all my money back, but I know it's going to, for me personally, I think that uh, 
it, it's going to a good cause and I can see the habitat work that they're doing and um, the species work that they're doing and their staff and everything. So I guess in my mind, that's how I, <laughs> how I look at it when I apply in other states. Yeah, and one thing too, Tristana, it, you know, some folks, you know, they may not want, uh, they may want a refund of that game hunting license, but really when you purchase that license, you're not only purchasing it for your big game hunt, you are now open to hunt any of our small game or purchase any of our over-the-counter licenses such as turkey, bear, cougar. So it, it really, you know, you're, you're able to take advantage of, of that side of hunting with the small game in. That's, that's a great, a great point. And I know that in the, in over the series, we talked a lot about big game, but we do have a lot of small game and migratory um, bird hunting that is an, an upland game bird hunting that is just, you know, pretty awesome. Right. Um, right. One of the questions that just came in, um, can, can you submit a, uh, a draw application with your 2021, 22 hunting license? No, you're required to purchase your, the next license year or the, that current license year, uh, game hunting license. The, so the for one this that upcoming, if, yeah, yes. So the, the one that if you get drawn, you'll be, you'll be hunting in. Yes. And that's such a good question. So thank you for asking that. Absolutely. And I saw a note here. Um, it, we will automatically refund the application um, besides the $7 and the $13, $7 for residents and $13 for non-resident, that application fee. All of that will get automatically refunded to the applicant, but it can take a little bit of time, right? It does. And typically, once the draw results are posted, and we have those set for April 27th of this year, once those are posted, typically those refunds, once you've been notified that you're unsuccessful, those refunds typically take from a week or so, uh, or or a couple of weeks to get out to customers. Great, and I noticed last year when I applied, I got um, some of them pretty quickly and some about a, I don't know, five to seven days later. So they don't all hit at one time. Right, and that's a good point, Tristana. So when the refunds come back, it's per application. So it won't be a, a let's say you put in for deer, elk, uh, pronghorn, those applications will, since there were individual transactions, those will come back to you individually. So it won't be a bulk refund. Yeah, I know I got my first one and I'm like, oh, I got must have got other species that I, <laughs> that yeah. I wasn't aware of. <laughs> yeah, and, and one thing too, I know folks, um, and this is just a, a side note, but with, uh, let's say you might, so let's say you have an application that you had submitted and for whatever reason you wanted to delete that application, what you could do, you delete that application in your online customer account. If you, that refund, that will be sent to you. If, if you delete that application, it will be sent to you within two, two business days or so typically. But let's say, for example, you have, um, you know, for whatever reason, you can't access your account. You can go ahead and give us a call and we can certainly delete that application. But with that refund time, that will be refunded to them, the customer, after our draw results during the same period of time that those individuals who are getting refunds who were unsuccessful. So that's kind of something to keep in mind with folks if, you know, if they happen to delete their application. So. And one of the questions I get about what related to deleting your application is if you decide, if you go through the application process and then decide, you know, I didn't really want that elk hunt, I want a different elk hunt, um, can you just change your your application or um, or what do you do if you can't just change it? Yeah, what you, so what you'll need to do, you'll need to go ahead and delete the application. Unfortunately, we can't edit applications. As a, cus or as a customer, you can't edit your application. It will have to be a new application that's submitted. So again, that advice would be to go into your account, delete the application and then resubmit the new one. Uh, or if for whatever reason you can't have, or you can't get access to your account, let's say, um, you have a grandson that applied for you and he was out of town. And anyways, just give us a call. We can go ahead and do that for you. Great. Great. I know I jumped ahead on our, our outline, but <laughs> it seemed to fit in that, in that part of the conversation. Yeah, it, it did. And I probably jumped ahead too, but it fit. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> 
Um, so going back, uh, going back a little bit, um, when somebody is interested in applying, um, we have some tags that can be um, can be done. Um, Sorry, my phone's going crazy. <laughs> we have some tags that can be purchased over the counter and some that have to go through the draw process. So what is the, the difference? What can be purchased over the counter? Yes, that's a great question. So we have deer, pronghorn, uh, turkey, cougar, bear, javelina. Those licenses can be purchased over the counter. Now elk, we have a what's called a, the E-plus program, the elk private land use program where certain landowners that are enrolled in this program, they can issue, they have, we're, we issue them as a department authorizations for them to then issue to hunters. And then those hunters who have that specific authorization can then purchase a, a license over the counter from our department. But for those folks that are just wanting to come out here, didn't put in for the draw, wanted to see what uh, species we have over the counter, they're welcome to put in for that javelina, deer, pronghorn, um, cougar, bear, turkey. Okay, great. Uh, and Barbary sheep. Oh, and Barbary sheep. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's always a, a few of them. Um, in at this point, I don't, I'm not aware that we have any deer tags that are over the counter unless it's specifically for a private landowner. Is that, is that correct? Yes. And that is correct. So deer, it is over the counter. Those, those sales go, uh, or you're available to purchase that tag come July 1st. And of course, over the counter, you'd have to, it's for private land deeded acreage only. So you would need written permission from the landowner to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, and so as you're going through the application process, and, and if you're gonna put in for, um, uh, yes, Curtis, Turkey is there, some Turkey over the counter as well. Um, yes. So if you're going to put in for um, deer and elk, um, how many times can you apply for, for each of those species? Ah, that's another great question. So you, you can submit only one application per species. And I know I, I have received a few calls about submitting multiple applications for one species, but it's simply one species or one application per species. Okay. Um, and then on that one application, I can choose up to, to three hunts? That is correct. So when you're submitting, let's say a deer application, uh, you have three choices. And that's when you can look at our rules and information booklet that offers those specific hunt dates and uh, hunt types for those species. That's where you can then select what your first choice would be, what your second choice would be, and what your third choice would be. Some folks, um, what I would encourage is for those folks that are submitting applications to, to take advantage of, of putting in for all three choices. It's not mandatory, but it's, it does uh, allow you more options uh, when, you're, when you submit that application. So that's one piece of advice I would, I would offer. Absolutely. And I know when we, um, last year we talked with Kevin Rodden and did a, a little bit on the draw odds. And one of the suggestions that he made was to, um, you know, to put your first choice as, you know, a harder to draw hunt, something that, um, you know, maybe not a, a very common experience that you'd get to have, but something's a little bit harder to draw. And then maybe your second choice is is maybe a little bit harder, but middle of the ground and your third choice, something that's easier to draw. And even if you may not get an elk, you at least get the opportunity to, to go hunt elk. Um, so I know that was one of the yeah. suggestions he gave. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, there's, you know, it's not required to put in all three choices, but yeah, again, take advantage of the three choices and uh, yeah, it just, it helps you out. Great. Okay. Great, thank you. And I see we're getting quite a few questions um, about some of the private land stuff. And, and in a couple of weeks, we will have um, our access, one of our access coordinators on, and we'll, we can dive a little bit more into those. Um, tonight, we're not going to get too far into some of those, those programs. So I would encourage you to sign up um, for the access um, webinar or to talk with our biologists if you have some specific questions uh, about those species, um, species specifically. But um, We'll do our best to, to get to ones that are that are rel relative for tonight. Um, so after I've done my three choices, and I can do um, one application, three choices for each species, um, except for bighorn sheep, it's a little bit a little bit funky, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, and then in elk and deer, there's a fourth choice offered. What what is that fourth choice? 
So that fourth choice, another great question, that choice allows hunters or those applicants that are putting in for the draw, it allows them to select a quadrant of our state. And let's say you have uh, a deer hunt in unit 52 and there's, let's say 150 licenses issued. Out of those 150, if there were, let's say four of those tags that were not issued, what that would allow, th those, those four leftovers that haven't been issued, that would then go in that pool that people chose, uh, that four choice in that Northwest part of the state. So it would, it would then sequence through those folks to issue them that tag. So it's, it's, it's just, I wouldn't say leftover, but it, it is, uh, it's those tags that weren't issued from the first three choices. Okay. So, um, and then, do you have to take that one or um, if it doesn't, if that hunt doesn't fit into your schedule, do you, do you have to take it? That is a good question. I, I know with the population, the, so there, I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but there is a fifth choice, which is a population management hunt. You certainly don't have to go on those hunts because those, that's where folks get put on a call list if they want to go on these hunts. So you're certainly not, um, yeah, you're certainly not obligated to go on these hunts. And I, I would imagine the same would be for choice four, but uh, I can certainly, I can do some research on it and get a better answer for you guys. Okay. And then the fifth choice, I know you just talked about it just a little, a little bit, but what is the, the fifth choice specifically? So the fifth choice, that's more of the population management hunts. So let's say if there's a, a management need uh, to, to, let's say, decrease a population in a certain area, those folks that have elected to be put on that call list, they will be, they'll get a call and see if they want to go on these, these, uh, these popula popula population management hunts. Typically those tags, let's say if it was elk, typically those tags are cow elk. Um, so it, it, it's not going to be a quality hunt. It's, it's more of those areas that need more of that management pressure. Great. Um, and I did just get word um, to, to make sure that we have the correct information. On the fourth choice, it is not not something you, you have to take that hunt. Um, well, you don't have to go hunting, but that is your hunt. You don't have the choice to, to turn it down, um, that tag. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. But thank you to, to our helpers that are, that are sending text messages that we appreciate. Yes. Um, okay, so that that's great, and I think it really helps, um, you know, to to think about how many times you can apply, um, and so one application per species, and you can apply for all of the species if you choose. It's a pretty good hit on your credit card, but it's it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Okay. It, someone has to get drawn, so I'd rather have my name in that that pool of somebody that could get drawn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. And uh, Michael, I just saw your question in here. And if you um, do get the fifth choice, it does not hurt your, if you do put in for a fifth choice, it does not hurt, hurt, hurt your odds of getting drawn for one of your first three choices. No, it does not. Perfect. Great question. Okay. Um, I'm gonna jump into a couple of our questions. Um, and I apologize. I know there's quite a few on Facebook and I haven't been able to keep up with all of them um, quite yet. Um, but one of the questions about uh, the application, um, can you submit the same location for all three hunts? Gosh, that's a great question. I, I believe, well, so for bighorn sheep, which is a little odd, you, you certainly can because in each of your choices, you have to select a different region or different hunt type. But if you're submitting an application for elk, deer, I haven't personally done it, so I, I'm not familiar, but I, let's see if our helper will help us out here and see if <laughs> get us an answer. <laughs> Perfect. We'll, we'll wait for a text. <laughs> yes. Um, phone a friend. Um, oh, we got an answer. Yes, as long as different hunt codes or dates. Um, what, one of the things to, to think about, and I, I don't want to get into exactly how the draw works, but um, I know everybody is issued a sequence, a random sequence number. And um, if you're drawn in there and your first choice is full, then you it looks at your second choice. If your second choice is full, it looks at your third choice. So if all of those are the, the same, um, it's gonna be full at your first choice or second choice. So I, 
I right. think um, the way I understand it is it would be better to, 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 to pick different hunt codes in there. Right, yes, that totally makes sense. Great, okay, um, let me jump back into the questions. Bear with me for just a minute. Um, can you talk about, um, do you have off the top of your head how many um, tags are allocated um, through the resident pool slash non-resident pool and the, the outfitter pool? Yes, absolutely. So our license quota, it, 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 it's as follows. 84% of the license sales must go to New Mexico residents. 10% goes to those outfitter pool. 6% goes to the remaining non-resident pool. And I, I should clarify with the outfitter pool, it's non-resident outfitter pool. And then 6%, of course, is the non-resident pool. Okay. So non-resident outfitter and in, in resident. Um, by by far gets the the large the large um, portion of that. Yes, in one way, what was really helpful for me, at least in my understanding of how those license how that quota is is spread out. Let's say you have a deer hunt, a hundred tags were issued. Of those hundred tags, eighty four go to uh, um, yeah eighty four go to New Mexico residents, ten go to uh, non resident guide and outfitters, and then six six of those tags would go to non-residents. That kind of cleared it up in my mind. Absolutely. And um, as I understand it, it can be at least 84 of those tags to residents, but residents even can get higher should the, the numbers work out in that favor, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And it is at, at least 84%. That's correct. Okay. That, sound, that sounds good. Um, and Curtis, I saw your question in there and our um, IT system does a great job every year of confirming this before we, um, before we, announce the draw results. They go through a very extensive process to, to make sure that those quotas have been properly allocated. Um, so, so yes, they do do that. And I had a phone a friend message. Um, the 10% of the outfitter pool can be residents with an outfitter contracted included in that. And um, so Larry, text me if I, if I misunderstand you, but I, I think what that means is that a resident or non-resident can qualify for that 10%, but you do have to have a contract with a certified outfitter before you can apply for, before you can qualify for that. I think, I think that I understood that out of, out of your text. He said yes, so. <laughs> um, okay. So jumping into our next question, because Scott just let us straight in there, but um, when you go through the application process, um, I really like hunting with my husband. I like hunting with my dad um, and, and kind of a group of people that I, I love to share that experience with. Can I apply with them? You certainly can. And we actually, we have party applications and I'm trying to find my paper here so I don't mix them up. But for, um, let's see here, for, Antelope, deer, elk, barbary sheep, and javelina, up to four applicants can apply to one application. Uh, we have turkey, oryx, ibex, up to two applicants can apply for those or attached to that in a party application. And then, of course, bighorn sheep, bear, those are just one single applicant. But yes, you're welcome to, to attach to an application uh, for those species. Uh, up to four with again those antelope, deer, elk, barber sheep, javelina, turkey, oryx, and ibex is two, and then bear and bighorn sheep is one. Okay, that that's good, and and I I know I enjoy it, and I always feel bad for you know the, the fifth person, but I, I worked it with people in other states that like three of us apply here and two up there, and we just hope somebody gets drawn and we all yeah. get the get, get to go with them. But um, one, if you one, up one, oh, I was <laughs> just gonna add one question that I've. I've received in the past is let's say you have a buddy of yours that is a non-resident, your resident, they want to come in and they, they want to attach to your application and they ask, is that beneficial or how does that, how does that um, affect my, my odds of drawing? Well, what that does, let's say if your resident and your friend wants to come hunt and attach to your application, that resident will be drawn into that 6% um, non-resident pool. So in a way, it's not really beneficial to the resident. And that's something that uh, I know we've had some common questions about that. that that's a good point. And um, you know, one of the things that we talked about last year with Kevin, I keep bouncing back to that, but it was such a, a helpful conversation looking at the draw odds is um, if there's a hunt with very few tags in it, you know, 10, 10 15 tags, 
the, the odds of one person getting drawn are, are pretty unlikely. And so you have, you have two people in there, it just makes it, makes it really, really tough. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's something true. to look at. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, um, definitely. Okay. And then another quick, quick question. Um, do we accumulate points if you're not drawn? We do not. New Mexico is strictly lottery draw based. Uh, no preference points. Um, our state does not do preference points. All right, let me let me jump back into our um, questions really quick. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, one of the things you have to do to um, apply for a hunt is to um, submit your harvest reports from previous years. Um, and so there's a couple of different deadlines for those harvest reports. Do you happen to have those in front of you? I do actually, let me okay. pull them in front here. I have them. Yeah. So let's say you had drawn out on a tag, a deer tag, elk tag, uh, this last year, last, uh, let's say it was September, September, October timeframe. Uh, the last time, the last, the deadline to apply or submit your harvest report would be uh, February 15th for those, for those licenses without having a penalty of $8 fee at, for submitting it after the fact. Uh, but let's say you had an Oryx hunt, um, Ibex, those, that deadline to submit that harvest report, because of course those hunts run into January uh, or even to March, uh, those, that, that deadline for that is April 7th. Great. Great. I know we said I had a question about somebody who had a Barbary sheep tag. And, and so you just, you definitely address that. Um, so you can, you can hunt all the way through that process, apply for the draw. And then as long as you have that harvest report in by yes. April 7th, you're, you're good. You're good. Yes. Yeah. But uh, if you don't submit a harvest report, you're essentially kicked out of the draw for every species. Uh, yeah. You you wouldn't be eligible to, to uh, even apply until you satisfied that harvest report whether that's paying for the $8, uh, the late fee, or just making sure you get that harvest report submitted on time. Okay. Very helpful. Um, okay, Ooh, we talked about that one already. Um, so going back to the application process and attaching um, to somebody's application, what, um, how, what, how do you do that? Because it isn't, it, it, you have to go into each customer's file essentially um, to submit that. So how do you attach to somebody's application? Yes, that's another great question. Uh, and and most, most common really. What we do or what you do rather is let's say you have a group of four that want to go on a deer hunt. Well, the first individual after determining what hunts you would like to go on and you're putting in your application, that first individual would submit the application. That application will provide you an application number and an attachment code. That next hunter, when they go in to apply for the draw, they'll log into their account, go ahead and put in, there's a section there that says either you're gonna create a new, a new application or attach to an existing. You wanna hit attach. And then there's an applicate that application number that the first hunter provided, as well as that attachment code you'll provide that and it will link you to that application. And same goes for the other subsequent hunters. Okay. And then I know last year when I attached um, to my husband that it came up in, um, whoever applied first, I don't even remember, it came up in our file and I could go back in and look at the account and say, um, you know, hey, this is, that he has attached correctly to, to my license and I can make sure that nobody else is attached to my license or to my application. Yes, and that's true, absolutely. Great. Um, okay. Um, so jumping back in, we talked about it a little bit right at the very beginning, but um, for somebody who is starting to plan and wants to look at hunt codes, um, where do they find the rules and information booklets today and then here in the next couple of weeks? Yes, that's a, another good one. So going back to our initial, I, I think I might have mentioned it previously, but um, we do have a limited supply this year of actual hard copies of the rules and information booklet. But for convenience, it is posted on our website. And in addition to that, we actually, we have it broken out in segments. So let's say, again, you wanna just focus on elk or deer. 
you're welcome to go in, select that segment and print it out if that's more convenient for you. Uh, but yes, online, we will also supply a limited number of copies, hard copies to our area office, which does include our Santa Fe office. And I know you mentioned it, Tristana, but I think those should be coming out maybe very soon, within the next two weeks. That's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm told, so. <laughs> yes, fingers yes, crossed. fingers crossed on that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so what type of errors, when somebody's going through this process, what type of errors can somebody fix on their own or how, what did they need to call the office if they're having problems? You know, really, I, I, if, if there, it comes to a point where you're having so much difficulty, whether submitting an application or even accessing your account, please don't hesitate, give us a call. There's always a representative here to help. But some things that you can manage on your own are on your own customer account would be you know, address changes, um, changing passwords, your username, you're welcome to manage that. But if for whatever reason you're having difficulties, don't hesitate to call us. We're really here to help you. And I, I would add to that to, to think about it ahead of time. I, I always laugh um, when I when I hear New Mexico is known as the land of manana, but because um, I procrastinate, <laughs> I lived in three different states and I procrastinate the same, same everywhere. Um, but this is one time where it, it pays off to not procrastinate. And um, I know a couple of years ago, right before COVID, I was working the phones and the, the wait time on the draw deadline day was pretty significant. Um, and we, we just couldn't help every customer that called in. So this is a great time to, to not wait and to use this information to apply early. Yes, definitely apply early. That's something we do encourage. And going back to that rules and information booklet, take the time to familiarize yourself with those hunts that you want to go on. And if you do need support applying and you want to call us uh, over the phone, make sure to have those hunt codes ready. That way we can go ahead and process that application um, in an efficient manner. But definitely be prepared. This is the time to ask questions uh, because yes, like you mentioned, Tristana, nearing the end of our draw period, which ends March 16th, we get a tremendous volume of calls and you know, we do our best to manage all of them, but some of them I just, we won't be able to get to. So please, yes, <laughs> go ahead and, and apply early. That's something we really encourage. Absolutely. And, and there is an incentive to for people to apply early. Um, if one week before, the week before we have a, a deadline and let me just double check the date. I think it's March 19th, March 9th. March 9th. March 9th, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but if people apply before 5 p.m. on March 9th, they can uh, qualify for an extra incentive along with uh, qualifying to put their application in. Yeah, and I believe there, so there's multiple um, partnerships that we've had and you, you would probably know more than I, but there's some with, is it Sportsman's Warehouse? Um, there's a variety that we have posted in our rules and information booklet as well as online, but they we do offer incentives for those folks that do apply early. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm trying to remember all of them. I should know them off the top of my head, but yeah, Sportsman's Warehouse has donated an external frame backpack that'll be, be given away. And, and this goes through a random draw process. So everybody that applies early, gets thrown in the hat, um, but there's there's gift certificates um, with some outfitters in New Mexico, with the archery shop in New Mexico, in um, Albuquerque, which is a really great archery shop if you haven't been there. I'm not an archer at this point, but every time I've been in her shop, it's absolutely amazing. Um, Onyx has partnered with us too. Um, so everybody who applies before that deadline will get a, a discount to Onyx so that you know you can grab land statuses. Um, it's what all of our officers use. So it's a, a great way to, to communicate and, and have that information at your hands. Um, I believe Federal Ammunition has also given us a coupon that everybody everybody will get to a discount to uh, merchandise, maybe not to ammo. Um, I haven't quite talked them into that one yet, but <laughs> but there will be a coupon um, for people. So it's definitely an extra incentive to to apply early. Um, do you know Tristana? Do you yeah. do you know uh, how many lucky incentive or how many lucky parties would get these incentives? Last year we had um, 12 
um, that we're able to get the incentives and then everybody that applied early. Um, and you do, when you when you apply early, you also have to select that you'll receive emails from us because um, we can't contact you and send you the discount codes if you don't give us a valid email address. And there's a little box in there that says that you will receive emails from the department. So you do have to check that box so that we, again, that we can contact you and send you this information. And I know last year, several people missed checking that box and, um, you know, it's, it's hard. We, we just can't quite send it to, to you if you, we can't contact you through email, um, which is how we send out those, those um, donations from our partners. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me jump back in here. I apologize. I lost my place. It seems to be happening a lot tonight. So after the draw is complete, um, some of the questions that we get, get pretty often, um, when will hunting licenses be mailed out? So if I buy my license in February when I'm applying for the draw, when does that get mailed to me? So the, those licenses will become available for print, uh, for, you know, for you to log into your customer account. Those are on March 23rd. You can go in and print those licenses up. Let's say you, you um, were successful in the draw and you wanted a paper carcass tag. Those get mailed out at the end of May and likely you'll receive those start of June, the first week of June, first to second week of June. Right, and I know last year I drew two species and got them like two weeks apart. So, so bear with it if you don't get your second one right away, um, yes. if, you're, if you're lucky enough. Um, I figured I drew all my luck last year, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then if somebody chooses to do the e-tag in the application, they, they have their choice. Everyone has their choice if you want to do the e-tag or have a, a paper tag mailed to you. Is that correct? That is, yes. You have the, either the paper tag choice or if you want to use the e-tag option, which is available on a smartphone, Android, Apple, uh, you can certainly download, download the app and use that. Okay. That's great. And I know we have a, a video out on our website. It's, it's a couple of years old, but it still kind of talks about how the e-tag works. So if you're at all thinking about the e-tag, it's great to check out that, um, that video and just see it. I believe it's, gosh, six or seven minutes. So it's a, a pretty quick and easy view to see if that, that one's going to work for you or not. Definitely. And one thing to add on that is it's, it's very convenient for folks, let's say, that want to buy a private land over-the-counter deer license and they don't want to wait, you know, we, have, we usually allow 14 days period for those carcass tags to be mailed out. Okay. But let's say they, they have a hunt coming up. It's a Thursday, their hunt starts Saturday. They can go ahead and download the e-tag app. So it's very convenient in that respect um, and go out on their hunt on, this, on that Saturday when they just purchased the tag, let's say on Thursday. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, okay, so I wanted to circle back around. Um, I think we have most of our <laughs> of our outline, but I wanted to circle back around to some of the questions and see if I can answer a lot of them. I apologize with all of the chat forums. I, I'm sure I have missed um, missed some. Um, but what if if you are starting to look now and want to be ready for the draw to open up on January 19th? Um, what is the best way to to do some research and figure out what hunts and what hunt codes will work for you? Again, I would familiarize yourself with the, the rules and information booklet. That would be the start. Uh, the other thing is if you do find yourself, let's say, wanting to apply for a hunt in the Carson National Forest in, in that unit or unit area, um, feel free. Now's the time to reach out to one of our representatives here at the office. Even our biologists, they're always willing to help. And even more so, we have uh, some additional help that are provided by our, our conservation officers, put you in touch with those individuals. Uh, they're boots on the ground and they're always more than happy to help. Perfect. And I see that Larry has um, started answering some questions. So Larry Garcia is one of our, um, our information center staff. And so I know he's been answering questions and, and texting us answers and stuff. So. Um, I know, yes, Larry, Larry, thank you for that support. We appreciate it. Yes, and for clarifying. Um, and I see one of the one of the things that I saw on our Facebook account um, are was a question about how the percentage of tags that are allocated. So if I if I got everything correctly, it's um, eighty. That's not right. Go through those percentages again. How many of the tags are allocated to residents, non-residents, and the outfitter pool? So it's up to eighty-four percent, or at least eighty-four percent resident, 10% uh, 
non-resident with the guidance outfitter, and then the remaining 6% is non-resident pool. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then, and so when you go to apply, you need to buy your license as part of the application, um, and then the license is not refundable, but if you are not drawn, a portion of the application will be refunded minus the application fee. Did, did I get that right? Yes, you got that totally right. And that okay. application fee, it does vary between resident and non-resident. It's $7 for resident and non-resident is $13. Okay. And on the residency, how long do you have to live in New Mexico to be considered a resident? It's at least 90 days, 90 days until you're considered a New Mexico resident. Uh, you can't, one, one important thing to note is you can't claim residency or partial residency in other states. So you have to be a New Mexico resident and have, have lived here for 90 days. Great. At least Thank 90 you. days. So, um, so William, I got your message. I, sorry, it took me a while to get back to it. But yes, since you moved here in May of 2021, you would be considered a resident um, meeting those stipulations, or at least with the information that I, I have available at the moment. Um, and I have a question here. Would you, do you know of any major changes that were made to the regulation or application process um, from the last season? Um, you know, I don't off the top of my head, I, I don't, but I can certainly do some research on that and make sure that if there was any significant changes, we could go ahead and, and get that, answer, that question answered. Uh, please feel free if you wouldn't mind sending that question to our ISPA email and we can go ahead and take care of it that way. Perfect. And I do know um, that next year there will be some significant changes because um, we have several rules that will be opening that the commissioner will hear. Um, and so I believe it's next week, our, at least from our wildlife management division will be on to talk about those rule changes and how everyone can get involved in those. So okay. I don't, I, I also can't think of a lot of major changes off the top of my head for this year, but next year, everyone will need to be on their toes. <laughs> okay, well, good. good. Great. Um, and then uh, landowner tags. Um, let, me, let me see if I, if I have this right and then correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if you're interested in the landowner tag, you have to get a code basically from that landowner that you have to have before you can purchase that tag. Yes. And so the, the going back to that E plus program, the elk private land use system program, those individuals who are landowners that are wanting to go and be enrolled in this program, or participate in this program, they have to submit an application. And this application, um, it gets submitted to our E plus program for their review and consideration, but your property has to meet a set or a certain set of criteria. And I'm not too familiar because I don't work under that program, but it has to meet this criteria in order to be part of this program. But yes, once it, the landowner is a part of the program, they get issued a, a number of authorizations based on uh, either negotiation or what the property supports. Those authorizations then get, uh, the landowner can then sell those to the, any hunters and the hunter can then purchase uh, elk license with that code. Great, great, thank you. So yeah, so you purchase that authorization and then and then come back and apply. And that then you come back and apply, uh, purchase the elk private land tag. Okay. Um, and is there any minimum age for somebody to apply and hunt um, big game in New Mexico? Uh, so the, the minimum age, so there's hunter education is involved in this too, but if you're 18 years or older, you're welcome to apply for the draw without hunter education. If you're, and I might be getting the ages wrong here, but if you're 11 to 17, you can apply for the draw if you have Hunter, for the big game draw, if you have hunter education or as a mentored youth. Yeah, I believe, and I, I know there's some age limits with the mentored youth, but um, Jason, I'd encourage you to come and join us on Monday. Um, we'll have Jennifer Morgan here with us and she can um, dive really deeply into um, age yes. requirements and how somebody can get their hunter education and the mentored youth and requirements for the youth mentor and all, all of that. So I, I know she can, yeah. she can delve in there pretty deeply. Um, okay. Bear with me. 
Um, and then when you attach to somebody's application, you can attach with somebody from in-state or a resident or a non-resident. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Great. Um, it just it just could change your odds a little bit. So definitely look into that. It does. Yeah, it definitely does. Great. Um, okay, so I know we have quite a few other questions. Um, and I think I've gotten most of them that are related to our conversation tonight. Um, but we do have, like I said, we do have 15 webinars in the series in total. So, um, you know, if you have questions about elk, please sign up for the elk one. Um, we'll have Tony Zapparano on with us and, and he can answer some questions about, about the elk program. And um, we do have our access, uh, one of our access coordinators, it'll be on to help talk about access. Um, gosh, we have a whole, the whole nine yards, pronghorn, deer, um, we do have an officer that will be on with us later in the month. And so we'll put um, Officer Bird, we'll put him to, to the test. So, nice. Um, nice. so feel free to send us those, those law enforcement questions, um, especially when you're looking at like um, some of the caliber restrictions I see that are listed in here, um, muzzle loaders, different, different types of like that. But please send us those questions because we'd be happy to answer them, but we'll, we'll put Ben on the spot. And, and, nice. and, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but are, is there anything else that you want people to know? Is, is there getting ready to apply for the draw? You know, I, I keep going back. Just one thing to, to start off with is really familiarize yourself with the rules and information booklet. And again, we really would like uh, our customers to take advantage of applying early, uh, putting their name in that hat for those incentive uh, prizes that we offer. But yes, going back, familiarizing yourself, getting the questions now that way we can answer those questions in a timely manner and I know again when we come to the end of our draw period the last two weeks we just see a tremendous amount of call volume and can't quite get to all these uh, questions and have answers for them so yes familiarize yourself with the rules and information booklet and ask those questions now great and I'm going to put up the ISPA email address um, ISPA at state.nm.us and um, that's a, a great way to send in questions. I know we have a, a tremendous team of people, um, including including you and including Larry, who's answering some of the questions for us. Um, so that's a, a great way to send in questions. Um, and our let me type in our phone number as well. So um, you're more than welcome to call us. Um, we are eight, eight to five Monday through Friday, except for um, holidays um, you know, that are, that are in there. So we can yes. we can definitely answer your questions that way as well. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody. Um, I'm slightly overwhelmed and, and, and very grateful. Um, like I said at the beginning, I was expecting like 30 to 40 people to, <laughs> to register and sign up and, and to have um, 130 and quite a few that are on Facebook as well. Um, I, I really appreciate that. I know we didn't answer everybody's question, but please feel free to, to send those in or to join into our webinar series later on and, and we can help address those a little bit further. Um, I'm going to really quick while I am closing out, I'm going to share the important dates again. So make sure that you mark these on your calendar. Um, our draw will be opening up here in a couple of weeks. Um, and very important to know on the draw deadline that there is a 5 p.m. deadline. Um, a couple of years ago, I was down at the roundhouse during session and one of the legislators said, I was applying at 458 and I didn't get it done and I got kicked out. And um, so it, it applies to everybody, but that there is a hard stop in our system at 5 p.m. So make sure and and don't wait till the very last minute um, to, to apply. So um, again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Art. Um, I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Larry, to, to jumping in and asking all these questions. So Yes, thanks, Tristana. I really appreciate it and really appreciate the, uh, the customer base. And again, don't hesitate. If there's any other questions you have, we're always here to help. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you next week to talk about hunter education and uh, uh, the rule process and how you can get involved in setting our big game hunting rules. So, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.